Hi everyone, I'm Danny Taylor. I am a member of the YAC community for many years now. I survived colorectal cancer when I was first diagnosed at 23 years old. And now I'm an oncology social worker and I'm so, so thrilled today to be joined by my friend Sharon Bray to talk to you today about journaling. Uh, Sharon, I just want to ask you to introduce yourself a little bit. If you can maybe tell the community who you are, those who haven't met you yet and what kind of brings you to this world. Okay. Um, well, I'm Sharon, and I've been leading uh, writing workshops, both creative writing as well as what we call expressive or healing writing, of which journaling is a part, for the last 20 years. I started doing that after I was diagnosed with a very early stage breast cancer. And I, at the same time, had come across the research by Dr. Pennebaker of the University of Texas. And I was so inspired, I decided that I was going to abandon all my former career life and just devote myself to writing and doing this work. So that's what I've been doing. I've written a couple of books on it, lots of articles, and both in the States and now in Canada with Gildas Club, I've been leading group writing workshops. I love the work. I love what comes out of it. I've also done many sessions on journaling, and most recently for yak and ovarian cancer, and I love doing that as well. So I'm hoping today that any insights I have, uh, because I am also someone who is a rabid notebook keeper, will be helpful to you if you're at all interested in writing, writing for health benefits, writing to reflect on your life, just writing and keeping a journal. Uh, perhaps today I can offer some tips and a little bit of knowledge about that process. Thanks, Danny. Awesome. Thank you, Sharon. So how does cancer and writing come together? How do those things link up? Well, the research on writing, we'll call it expressive writing. Expressive writing and journaling falls under this is when you write freely. You don't worry about grammar. You don't worry about spelling. You don't worry about anything. You just keep your pen moving and you dump whatever you're feeling, uh, whatever's on your mind onto the page. The benefit of that is that you release those negative emotions that are, we know, kept in the body are not good for your health. And so how does cancer fit into this? Well, part of what I'd always done way before cancer, in fact, when I was a kid, I started keeping a notebook. I always call it keeping a notebook, but it's a journal, except that mine was bright yellow with spirals and I use purple ink and all of those things to write my big thoughts. But more than that, my crushes. It was sort of... <laughs> diary sometimes, mm -hmm. except I stopped writing a diary when my brother took it and ran off with it while we were on a camping trip. And that was very embarrassing. <laughs> I went after him and ended up with 19 stitches in my legs. So I decided notebook was a better option. But I've written myself through trauma and unexpected loss and pain and anguish and every other thing that is part of being human. And it's been so helpful for me. And when I discovered the research on writing and healing, it seemed like the natural thing to do, to begin a writing class, a writing group for women and later on men, at first it was breast cancer, who were diagnosed and living with cancer. And I used a creative writing approach which is to explore cancer, but through the use of prompts and exercises. It was so powerful for me and for the group members that that just launched me into doing this work. Now you'll find writing, journaling, very much integrated into the support programs, the healing methodologies for cancer. Wow. But what about maybe some of those in our community that uh, don't identify as writers, that um, might feel nervous writing or never felt good writing? Um, is writing something that would be helpful for them too? I think it's worth a try. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people associate writing with, you know, the Margaret Atwoods, uh, 
the great poets, the novelists that you love, the people who get their name in print all the time, writing equals publishing. Mm. That's not true. William Stafford, one of my very favorite poets, he was uh, a be much beloved poet in the state of Oregon in the United States and beyond. But he had a definition of a writer, which I think is really useful for anyone to begin with, which is a writer is someone who writes, <laughs> period. And so very often when I would start a writing workshop and people would be timid, I'd hear, well, I'm not a writer, but you know, I thought I'd give this a try. I would offer that definition. And I would first say, Do, does anyone write emails? Does anyone write shopping lists? Um, does anyone uh, doodle and uh, uh, write and draw and do those things? And, and hands would go up. People write, mm. we all can write. And if you write something, anything in the language that is natural to you about your life, your feet, you will say something beautiful. Wow. So functionally, what does that look like? If I'm new to writing, like I get that I write emails and I write grocery lists and all of that sort, but how do I now take this to somewhere where I'm gonna get health benefits out of it? Or like, how do I start? Well, for those of you who like to write longhand like me, <laughs> you know, you want to invest in a journal. Um, mm -hmm. They come in all shapes and sizes. I've had this one for a zillion years and in it, I can just insert blank paper with lines. <laughs> there we go. Um, that's one kind. There are spiral kinds. There are little kinds. I have a little journal, uh, a Moleskine is the label. Uh, Hemingway used to use them, you know, why not? But a little journal that I keep in my purse because sometimes if I'm sitting having a coffee well, after I'm out shopping, I'll just be watching and something will come up, an interesting mm -hmm. conversation I overhear that triggers something in me and I'll write, I'll just write it down. I don't know where it's going. Um, you just say you're worth it. Go out and buy a journal and take some time to find a notebook that looks the right size. If you like blank pages, line pages, whatever, and try to commit to giving it a try. How do you do it alone? Well, you make a little space for yourself where you won't be interrupted. You promise yourself that maybe two times a week maybe three, you'll set the timer for 10 or 15 minutes. And during that time, you write. Well, what do you write about? Anything? You can start with the weather. Uh, you can start with a quarrel you've had with your sweetheart. Uh, you can start with the fact that maybe you woke up with a headache and you just feel crappy. Uh, you can start with something that you observe, something that's on your mind, or there are a bazillion writing prompts out there. You can start with a prompt. What's a prompt? Well, I have a blog site where I just, every couple of weeks, write a, something that's themed about cancer with a lot of writing suggestions. Well, in my writing workshops, I use variations of that. So what's a prompt? I'd say, right about the time that you first heard the word cancer. That's a prompt. Uh, what do you fear? That's a prompt. Who do you care about? That's a prompt. What do you hope for? That's a prompt. Anything can be a prompt. An object, old photographs, something you read, or just stuff that's on your mind. Journaling is a process of reflecting on your life, expressing it and reflecting. And that's what it's about. And you can start anywhere. What if I do go across a question, like you just asked, like the first time I heard cancer and I find it really, really upsetting. Like, what do I do with that? Oh boy. My, some of my journals <laughs> were filled with anguish. Uh, and the example I'm going to give you was not about cancer, but it was about the drowning death of my husband when my daughters were nine and 10. 
And I had to take care of them. I had to be there to take care of his parents emotionally. Um, I didn't have much time to take care of me. Mm. I wasn't seeing a therapist or anything like that. I was just too busy, worried about my daughters losing their father, how we were going to make ends meet. The list goes on. And so I wrote. Mm. I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I poured out my sorrow. I would cry and weep when I wrote. I poured out my questions. I poured out my anguish. I poured out my anger because anger was part of it. How could he be so careless? How could he be so silly to do what he did? Mm. And that is part of release. And part of journaling is release. And I just wrote Freely. I filled dozens and dozens of notebooks during that time without prompts because I was full of wow. emotion. Does that and, make sense? Yeah. And are those journals, are they just for you or do you share them? <laughs> well, here you go. <laughs> no, I don't share my journals. Yeah. But I did, uh, in a burst of misguided enthusiasm after I'd been doing creative writing, teaching, and so on for quite some time, decide that I would write about that time only to protect my daughters. I decided I would turn my memoir, so to speak, which was basically all my journals, into a novel. Um, the good news is that I went at it and I had four distinct rewrites, got feedback, and so on. The not so good news, by the time I finished the fourth rewrite, I thought, this has become chick lit. Mm -hmm. It's not, not my story anymore. Mm -hmm. And the protagonist, who was me, was, you might imagine, much too perfect, mm -hmm. not flawed at all. And I put it aside. And what I realized is I'd done my own narrative therapy. Mm -hmm. I had written that story and I had rewritten the ending to be a happy ending. And I had done my own therapy. That's, that was really important. Uh, I didn't need to share that story with anybody uh, other than anecdotally. I didn't need to put it out in the world. Uh, so have I shared my journal? No, but sometimes in my journal, I'll write a silly poem. I'll write a serious poem and maybe I'll read it to my husband. Uh, maybe I'll use it in a writing workshop, but on the whole, I don't share very much, no matter what kind of a journal. I'll talk about that in a minute that I keep. Okay. okay. When I would be, let's say, journaling on my own and, and let's say I'm not sharing, how do I know that I'm journaling about the right things or <laughs> that it's working? <laughs> well, uh, there is no right thing to write about. Mm. You can write about anything. But there is, a, we call it the lookout for going down the rabbit hole. Mm. Uh, it's easy when you're really emotionally upset, like I was during that uh, time of becoming a single mom, um, that we can ruminate. I started replaying some of the material, some of the questions, some of the anguish I had repeatedly over and over mm. and over and over. And at first, writing felt great. But as I began rewriting and re-questioning and repeating all of that material, I began to feel worse. Mm. I took my daughters to a therapist, not me, my daughters <laughs> to a therapist and said, they need to talk. Yeah. And the therapist met with them for three or four weeks and then had me come in again and he said, the girls are fine. He said, they're grieving. Um, your parenting skills are good. Let it, let it be. You know, I'm here if you need me. And I burst into tears and I said, well, then why do I feel so bad? He said, I think it's mommy who needs to talk. Well, I did. So I did go to a therapist. I've often joked that he looked like Robert Redford, so it made it easy to <laughs> stay there. But what was interesting, I also wrote in conjunction with therapy. Every week I would show up in the therapist's office with a poem. Mm. And the poems at first were a little too, too many words, 
wordy, you know, but then they got better and better and tighter and tighter and more. They were changing. They weren't about mourning. They weren't about grief. They weren't about anger. I was starting to see humor. I was starting to feel alive again. I was starting to feel hopeful. Mm -hmm. And they reflected that. Uh, so you ask, what shouldn't you write about, Manny? Anything goes. But what you need to be vigilant about is, am I feeling worse if I continue to write about this? If you are, then shift gears. You can write, but write about other things. So let's say I were to give myself like 20 minutes a day to be writing. Um, should I like end on something funny or light? Is there like a shape to the, the writing session I should have? Or is it just anything goes? Well, I, I would say anything goes, but I'll tell you when I'm in a dark place, <laughs> frustrated place, when life gets to me place, um, I try to end with at least two or three, four or five things that are simply, I am grateful for. Yes, this is bad. Yes, this makes me angry, but I'm grateful for. I'm great and remind myself that stuff happens in life. And every single one of us, hardship, disease, death, breakups, all of it. What matters is you have to balance that out from time to time by just remembering what's good. Yeah. Uh, what's important. So sometimes you'll see, I'll see at the end of my pages, but nevertheless, I am grateful for, and then I make a gratitude list. Okay. So involving gratitude seems like a, a great path. And then also potentially if, if you think you'd benefit from therapy or have a therapist in your life, bringing journaling and, and therapy together. Um, so when we're talking about journaling and in cancer in particular, what are some other places that we can go to if let's say my cancer story has been kind of stagnant for a while, I'm, I'm not in treatment, it's not as actively on my mind. What are some places I can travel to that will maybe remind me or, or just inspire me to talk about my cancer experience? Well, sometimes the cancer, you, you're tired of talking about cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> So write about life or do other things. Writing, I've got them, a couple of examples here, is not the only way to journal. The, the lovely thing about journal, if you're tired about expressing cancer in words, then why not, if some of you are artistically inclined, why not express it in different ways? I've done joint workshops with a studio artist in South Carolina, we at one time were traveling to Mallorca to do them, which was quite wonderful, but we've also worked in her cancer community and mine. A mixture of writing and collage. Um, I have journals that I had written in that I also cartooned oh, that really? ex <laughs> expressed <laughs> what I was feeling. <laughs> See, the wayward elevator, which way up, which way down. Um, you can watercolor. Some of you might paint or draw, so paint your journal. Um, wow. This has a story about my dad in it. It's tied to the year before he died from lung cancer and picking all the persimmons off our persimmon tree, except for one, mm. which a squirrel got. And it bothered him until this little squirrel went up the tree and got it uh, for him. I've also journaled what I call mandala meditations. So you can use colored pencil. Uh, they can be black and white. I can't see these very well, doesn't matter. But writing around the edge and then afterwards starting to give myself material as I'm meditating on the mm -hmm. mandala to make notes of what comes up in my head, what thoughts, that becomes material for writing. Wow. You can try taking a writing class, learn how to write poetry, um, write a novel, uh, write a memoir, or take a break. Don't write. Do something different. Uh, take a sculpting class. Do something expressive, I think is the point here. Uh, it doesn't just have to be writing. It can be a combination of things. 
And journals can be, when I find, I, I dive into the research from time to time on writing and health and so on. And I find books that really inspire me. I have a journal of quotations uh, from these books that I will throw into my workshops or, or they become material for prompts. So it's limitless is what I'm saying. It's limitless. And then so today we've we've seen and now talked about lots of kind of written materials or, or tangible things like that. But what if I'm more of like a, a phone and a computer person? Is that okay? Am I allowed to journal that way? Well, I'm such a Luddite when it comes to the <laughs> telephone and, you know, my iPhone that um, if, if you're comfortable, you know, my thumb gets in the way. I misspell so repeatedly that I can't stand it. But yes, if you're more comfortable with keyboard, go there. The point is, write in the way that is most natural to you. It doesn't have mm. to be pen and ink. I happen to love ink pens and paper. So of course, I'm gonna opt for that first. The other problem for me is when I start writing and I do a lot of it on my uh, laptop, I start editing mm. right away. It's the teacher in me. And I see I've misspelled, I've got clumsy wording and what that does is stop my process. So try not to do that. But the bottom line is whatever way is most natural for you is the way to write. Okay. You had mentioned uh, that there are researchers that, that look at this kind of field or, or style. If I were somebody that's looking to, to know more after this conversation, who are some of the researchers that I should be typing into Google or going through my university library to find? Well, the, the father of all of this writing movement is James Pennebaker, P-E-N-N-E-B-A-K-E-R. Wonderful, wonderful psychologist generous with his work. He endorsed both my, both my books, but he's, he initiated this massive body of research on writing and healing. Mm. Another is to look at Kay Adams. Kay took journaling and made it into journal therapy. And she has programs and prompts and a way to do it. If you just Google journaling, you'll get a bazillion hits. If you Google journal, journal therapy, you will get a bazillion hits. <laughs> if it's journal therapy, you want to pay attention to who's writing about it. Um, you want to see some degrees and background in therapy, counseling, and writing. Oh, by the way, <laughs> you know, just kind of important. <laughs> But, uh, and it's not always the case. Everybody gets on the bandwagon when there's something new or uh, earth, you know, the, uh, some, there's always a movement. I think years ago of when coaching first became popular in the corporate world and all of a sudden there were coaching institutes everywhere. Mm -hmm. Writing, aggressive writing, journaling is a bit like that. So, you know, read, uh, read knowledgeably. Okay. Speaking of reading, if let's say I am, I'm journaling and I'm kind of inspired by the stories that come out of cancer, who are some other voices that I could look to um, that are maybe sharing their writing, um, maybe poets or, or memoirists or whichever? Any top recommendations for the class? <laughs> <laughs> well, my first most favorite book about writing and healing is Louise de Salvo, D-E-S-A-L-B-O. It's called um, Writing as a Way of Healing, how writing, how telling our stories uh, transforms our lives. And my copy is well-worn and dog-eared. Poetry, the two best volumes of poetry about cancer are called The Poetry Cancer Project. The editor is Karen Miller and volumes one and two. My favorite volume is volume one, but her the poetry in there is from cancer survivors, from health practitioners who took care of people with cancer, from spouses and loved ones. It is a wonderful collection of cancer-related poetry. Tiva Harrison, for all of us, uh, Canadian, uh, her illustrated journals uh, are extraordinary. 
And even Carol Shields, she didn't write a lot about it, but you'll find she had some things to say about cancer. She was diagnosed and died five years later. Um, and she was our Pulitzer Prize winner many years ago for the Stone Diaries. There's so much out there, but those are my favorites right off the top of my head. Oh, awesome. Oh. <laughs> no, no, please, if it got an oh, oh, my, my. <laughs> if it got like a, a big excited, like you got to tell us. <laughs> well, if you like to read big, thick books, I would really recommend uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee. Sure, he. Yeah, I always get M U K J. Uh, I can't even misspell it. I look close my eyes. I, M. Oh well. Anyway, the book is <laughs> uh, the Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer. It's brilliant, and he does talk about patients being storytellers first and foremost. And there's a big move in medicine to what we call narrative therapy, narrative medicine. Not only getting patients to write and tell their stories, but doctors, because you become more aware of story and how story is the currency of medicine. And getting doctors to write and tell their stories. I led a writing workshop for 12 years in the Stanford School of Medicine is extraordinary because they become more open, more vulnerable in their writing, and thus better able to listen and appreciate the patient perspective. Mm -hmm. So you see this movement, journaling, expressive writing is enormous and the benefits are enormous on both sides, the healer and those needing to be healed. Wow. Do you think that, let's say, somebody journaling about their cancer experience could bring in a piece of writing to their oncologist or to their care team? Uh, it's actually happened out of my groups. So I'll tell you the one story. Mm -hmm. And I will say that I, I, I see a cardiologist. I have heart failure, which is a result of radiation therapy. But, oh, uh, well. But um, I send poetry to my cardiologist. Turns out she rather likes it. So uh, I do that. And the interesting thing is I don't see her any more frequently, but I feel a stronger connection and trust in her because she's been responsive. And I've sent some of the things I write to what I write. Um, in my group, a woman had been given a death sentence. She'd been with her same oncologist for a decade. And um, the day that he told her there was nothing more to be done was the day before the writing group. And she came to the writing group and I gave them an exercise called the unsent letter, mm -hmm. meaning to write to someone. And this is a good exercise. Uh, and just pour your heart out what you want to say to that person. And she wrote to him. Of course, the, the, the thing is the letters never meant to be, be sent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just for you. But she wrote to him in, her, in this exercise because she felt he'd been impersonal and cold and not at all like he had been as her oncologist for so many years. And she read it to the group and we all had tears in our eyes when she finished. Two weeks later, she came back and she was light and smiling and she had done something no one has ever done. She took the letter in and read it to her oncologist. And it expressed how she felt that she was, he was cold and impersonal and all of those things. And what it did was it bridged the relationship and put it back. He admitted that he was so pained by that information. Mm -hmm. He couldn't look at her. He was trying to keep his composure. And mm -hmm. it was a rare moment of honesty and reconnection. And he stayed with her until her death. And their relationship was very important. Wow. Thank you, Sharon. I want to be mindful of our time. Um, but I'm sure we could talk about this for hours and hours and yeah, hours. I can. <laughs> <laughs> Are there like things that we haven't talked about yet around writing or maybe things that we just touched upon briefly that you want to round back on that you want to kind of highlight for our viewers 
is the main thing. There's so much research on the health benefits of expressive writing, and you can certainly tap it into it on your own, but writing has health benefits uh, without question. The one thing I would say to you is try. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't already, try. It might not work. There might be some other kind of therapy, art therapy, but very often the two meet. Pennebaker himself said to me that the most healing kind of writing is done when you couple image and word, right? But the most important thing is not, you know, I think of the little engine that could, <laughs> one of my favorite children's stories. <laughs> I like kids' stories. They're very, they get down to it. But you may not think you can, but you can. Mm -hmm. And the most amazing things happen in my groups with people who come and say, well, I'm not a writer, but I thought this looked interesting. Mm. And I'll go back to the beginning. They discover that they too can move people to tears, that they write things that make us go, oh, it's so powerful and beautiful because it's about life. And it's about the shared human experience. And we know that sharing our stories matters. It helps us heal. And so try. Well, Sharon, I guess on that note, where can people find you? Where can people, <laughs> if they want to know more, if they want to get a hold of these writing prompts that you mentioned, where can we go to find you? Ways. One is my blog site. Um, www.writingthroughcancer, all one word, writingthroughcancer.ca. I also have a second blog site that uh, was about heart failure. I've changed it to writing about life. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, since I've changed it, it's new. I'm getting ready to write the persimmon story actually for it. Because anything, it's important to write about our lives. And I'm at a stage where now I've got grandkids and I'd like to share some of my family stories, some of the family history with them. So that blog site, because I'm there too, is uh, www.writingtheheartalloneword.ca. And finally, my email, easy, Sharon at SharonBray.ca. Any of the above. Thank you, Sharon. So. Something that a lot of the YAC staff likes to do when we bring on somebody is uh, to just inspire people to get kind of moving into action as quickly as possible or whichever. So if I were to imagine one of the YAC community watching this video and let's say they were just gonna close their screen and, and pick up a pen, do you have a writing prompt to leave them with for today for maybe their very first chapter? Right about before and after cancer. Before mm -hmm. cancer, I was. After cancer, I am. Make a list first. Take two or three minutes and just make a list. Take the page, separate it into two columns before. List a bunch of stuff after. List a bunch of stuff. Now, look at it. You might take any one, two, or three of those and begin to write a narrative, a story. You might write a poem that is simply before after, before, after, you can play with that. But it's a good place to start because it reminds you that you're still going. <laughs> and in fact, you might be stronger in some ways than you were before. Mm -hmm. So explore that. So that's one I'd leave with you. And the other is, of course, what are you grateful for? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. I'm really grateful for this conversation. I always love to talk to you about writing and cancer and everything in between. It's really such a pleasure to have you and, and I hope we'll get to do more together for the YAC community soon. Um, but please check her out online if you wanna get started in this writing journey. Um, and please also feel free if you have writing to share, there's the YAC Facebook group that's all private and secret. If you have something that just feels really important to share with people that get it, I really encourage you to, to go ahead there. And if you're starting to feel more confident, you can always submit things to be published to the YAC website for the blog as well. Um, Sharon, you're an angel. Love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> I didn't bring my halo today. <laughs> well, 
put editing and post maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll get real crappy. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you so Danny. much, my dear.